Welcome to the Hermit's Lamp Podcast. I want to give a big shout out to the fine people who are supporting the Patreon. Not only are they making this happen, which uh, certainly I feel very supported by that process, uh, but also they've started getting all sorts of great new things. I've been recording extra Patreon exclusives with the guests who've been on. Uh, We've had Jen Zart on talking about some astrological aspects. Uh, We've had Al Cummins talking about geomancy and pizza magic. And uh, we've had the Stacking Skulls crew on talking about their musical influences, both spiritually and ridiculously in their lives. And all of this stuff is only for people who are supporting the Patreon. So please consider it. Think about how many hours of this podcast you've listened to and jump over to patreon.com slash the hermit's lamp. If you pledge $5 an episode, you will get access to all of that good stuff, but there are perks at many levels as well. Thanks for supporting it. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to another episode of the Hermit's Lamp podcast. I am here today catching up with Melissa Lucia, who we've been, uh, I had Melissa on five years ago. I didn't look it up before we started, but it's definitely been a while. And a lot of things have changed for both of us during that time. But uh, as we've been going through, our, going through our lives, I've been watching the amazing artwork and the sort of uh, interplay of artwork as magic, artwork as divination, artwork as life uh, that mirrors a lot of pieces of my own journey as well. And, you know, also the conversations I had in a previous episode with uh, Cyrus Ware as well. Um, so I wanted to have Melissa on to talk about this and to talk about a bunch of other stuff. Um, so if you haven't listened to that first episode, there'll be a link in the show notes, go find it and give it a listen to freshen up. Cause we're definitely going to reference a few things from it. Uh, but for those who, who haven't been following you, Melissa, who, who are you? What are you up to? Hi. What's going on? Hi, Andrew. Delighted, delighted to be here. Um, I'm Melissa Lucia and I, I've changed a lot in the last couple of years and I'm very pro name changes. <laughs> It drives some people insane, uh, but I'm I'm going by Lucia these days, partially because of the graffiti also, when I thought about what's my graffiti name going to be, Lucia uh-huh. came in, and Perfect. so I am Lucia, and, but people have known me for so many decades, if you call me Melissa or Melissa, it's, it's all going to work, mm-hmm. and I am an artist and an oracle, an empath, an entrepreneur, and... I am a person who follows the signs and follows the synchronicities and has found this ability to have courage, but also joy drive everything that I do. And so there's a whole variety of things that I do from having created a visionary deck in the New Mexico desert down in graffiti tunnels called the Oracle of Initiation. I teach online courses. I teach in person and adventure is the greatest joy of my life. Mm -hmm. Well, so you, you mentioned one thing in passing here, um, which, which I want to sort of talk a bit about first, right? What, tell me about the graffiti. Like, what is it about graffiti? <laughs> and, and even more so, how did that move you to change your name? Oh, well, I've, I've, had, I've had a lot of different spiritual names, and Melissa Lucia is my pen name. And when I was writing my Oracle book in 2000, 2011 that I was writing the book to go with this six-year project of making my Oracle of Initiation deck. Mm -hmm. And my my legal name is Melissa Weiss Steele. So that's my father's name and then my deceased husband's name. And and I like that. There's a there's a very traditional side to me actually that likes the solidness of that name. But I wanted a more magical name and I wanted a name that was going to possibly what I found is that mystics, empaths, whatever words you want to call us, that we struggle with being seen. 
that there's been so many lifetimes of being killed for who we were, that there's some um, really pretty serious base shocker issues about, am I going to be taken out in this lifetime for letting everybody know that I'm psychic Mm. and, you know, whatever creative, whatever intuitive words you want to use. And so Melissa Lucia, in some ways, it, it also was Tibetan numerology. So it was designed to be auspicious in, in abundance and connection. Um, but it, I wanted it to be this public face, this filter for the woo-woo side of going out into the world. So I like name changes. In the last couple of years, as I say, I'm going to be, we're going to talk about this, but I'm going to be 50 this year. I'm the happiest I've ever been in my whole life. It's like, ev- like things have landed. I've integrated and all of my gifts are now available to me, a lot of them, in ways that I've dreamed of, that I've worked towards for decades. So the Lucia for the graffiti, um, I fell in love. Well, I fell in, there's a song from, I mean, there's a phrase from the movie um, Brown Sugar about when did you fall in love with hip hop? I fell in love with hip hop when I was 12 years old at middle school. And I was in Seattle, Washington. And this was um, Grandmaster Flash. So this was 1980. Um, this gentleman walked behind me, this young guy in middle school, and started singing the, the words to the song, It's Nasty, which is amazing. And my whole body lit up. And, you know, I was pretty shy as a young one. And I went, what the hell is that? Oh. And it, like, it, it, it owned me from then on. And I'm a 80s, 90s hip hop fanatic. And talk to me about it any time. And to me, that's our tribal roots. That's our, that's the basis. Those are our bards, our griots. Those are our contemporary truth tellers is hip hop is one of those places. And, you know, the tribal beat and all of that. That's why it's worldwide because it's archetypal. So graffiti is part of that. And when in the mid eighties, my mom took me to Paris, bless my mom. And in Paris, they had this stencil graffiti that was insane the skill level was off the charts of this stencil graffiti that was all over Paris and I once again I'm a very passionate person I fell head over heels in love with the graffiti and for some reason it took me decades to do it myself but um, I do wheat paste and I do my collages my my digital physical collages and they're very pop culture irreverent um, punk rock um, we're both punk rock. That's part of one of our connections. And so, mm. but you need it. You need a name. You need a tag. I don't, I'm not aerosol, so I'm not spraying my tag, but you, you want to, you, this is a, this is a conversation with, oh, look at that. Mm-hmm. There's some of my Andy Warhol. Uh, I've collaged some of the Andy Warhol Polaroids because they're brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, so the name change, I wanted a name, a hashtag. So it's hashtag Lucia Graffiti. <laughs> Um, go on Instagram. It's all over Instagram. But it's, um, it's been this incredible joy because, you know, Adam Ant, we're going we're gonna to bust out the 80s. You don't drink, don't smoke. What do you do? You don't drink, mm-hmm. don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't generally do drugs. And, but I need some risk. I need some challenge. I need something that's disobedient, that's rebellious. But I... I choose to not be incarcerated. I choose to not have my life fall apart from addiction. So I need things that are going to give me that risk, like trespassing, without um, without tanking my life. So graffiti is that for me. It's it's sharing my art, a conversation with the other street artists, self sanctifying myself, and I get my my risk, my adrenaline risk, and I love it. Is that a? Do you think that's a punk rock thing? Is that is that also part of? Uh your empath stuff? Like where, where does that need for risk come from? I am, um, I'm a very, it's funny. If you meet me, I actually come across as pretty friendly. Um, I'm pretty sweet to a certain degree. I mean, if you can read energy, you can tell that there's a lot going on, but generally my public face is pretty friendly, Mm -hmm. which has its complexities to it. People judge that in some ways, but I can also burn paint off the walls. And so I think there's, an, there's always been a, a broad range of impulses within myself, like the Martha Stewart side and then this hardcore mystic um, side. And so I think that somehow that risk helps me to integrate some of these complexities. Like there's this part of me that's really ancient and doesn't want to become a junkie, but 
I want some of those feelings of what it might feel like, or, or, you know, like how so many sexual partners that you get sexual diseases or whatever. I haven't done that. And so, but I need my level of intensity needs that sometimes. Hmm. So I think it is, I think that's why I was drawn to punk rock. Why I'm drawn to hip hop is that they're very fierce um, energies and they're very um, rebellious maverick energies. Yeah. I, uh, cause I, I have that adrenaline piece, right? Like I need, I need that kick of adrenaline somewhere, you know? And uh, when I was younger, it used to sort of be, there, there was this moment, um, I, I went skydiving with a bunch of people I was working with. Everyone's like, let's go skydiving. And I'm like, Great, let's go, let's do it. I'm ready. And, um, at the time I was doing like downhill mountain biking and full contact martial arts and like all this stuff. And so I, I climbed in the plane with everybody else. And as it took off, I had a little butterfly in my stomach. And then I, I got, it got to be my turn and I jumped out and, you know, shoot opens and I sort of float to the ground and so on. And I remember landing and going, yeah, that was cool. <laughs> and everyone else was like, oh my God, oh my God, that was the best thing ever. And like a couple of days later, I had this moment of like, I think I, I think I need to slow down. I think that I just have such a, different relationship to adrenaline and to excitement and to risk that that I was like I don't know where else this goes and I don't know that if I allow it to continue that it doesn't end up unchecked in in some really dangerous way or you know the cost starts to get higher and higher right right so yeah well and you're also you're a father so you're a father and you're a partner and Mm -hmm. so I would imagine I didn't get kids in this lifetime but I would imagine that that could be a piece of it but what what do you do what do you do now for that need uh i rock climb like at a gym so you know Mm -hmm. relatively safe but uh but definitely sort of out there pushing myself and you know it's uh you know when i'm like 20 30 feet up the wall at the gym and i'm like trying to make the next move and don't think i can make it you know, or not sure I can make it. There's, there's nothing else, right? There's, there's no, there's no <laughs> thoughts. There's no feelings. There's just this complete presence in the moment and, and the focus on that. And then either the, yes. the elation of completion. Oh, I did make the move or the, the zing of adrenaline as I missed the move. And then the, and then the, like, Oh, and the rope caught me. This is cool. And now I'm going to try it again next week and next week. Okay. You know? So, yeah. Well, and this is something, this is really beautiful. This is something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, as I uh, alluded to earlier, I'm 50 this year mm-hmm. and I'm the happiest I've ever been. Like something, some critical mass has happened and being an empath, an, um, I've become an empowered empath is the words that I'm using for it now. And I'm still working on articulating this. Like I'm catching up with who I am, but there's some piece I've been because I'm, I'm a teacher, I'm a systems maker, I design online courses, I teach workshops, I'm fascinated with the steps of how you create things. That's, I, as I say, I have, a syst- I have a very visionary mind, but I also have a very practical Capricorn systems mind. What are the seven steps that we need and what are the 14 steps that come off of each of the seven steps? I love designing things. And so I've been thinking about what happened for me that was applicable to other people to have this critical mass of confidence because what i've found with empaths and with people who are very sensitive and so pretty much anybody who's listening to this podcast is an empath you're going to be a highly sensitive person and what i found right right all of us that's that's who we are and so i've been sitting with this i call it the confidence gap that first and i had this for decades so that's why i understand this is mm-hmm. because we, we are such weather vanes for other people's issues because we can feel them, depending on what type of an empath you are. Um, we don't always know our own voice or our own center. We're usually battered around by everything that's around us. And so what I found was I became control, my controlling perfectionist would come up. Mm-hmm. And what I've done over the last uh, couple of decades the couple of things that I've come to at this point, like I say, I'm still working on articulating this is courage and joy. Like there's this there for me, there's this critical mass where you have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone over and over and over again. It's like a training. It's, it's Mm -hmm. energetic cross training. 
but it has to be driven by joy. There has to be some passion at some points. And sometimes it's hard. I'm not going to say it's always a cakewalk. But there, those two things, those if you don't have those two things, they work together. Like there's this, you gain the confidence, you gain the power, you gain the um, ability to trust yourself through doing those things that are out of your comfort zone but it has to be fun as hell at some point too, to really enliven you. And so just thinking about, you know, all these pieces that we're talking about, about the risk, but also the presence, you know, it's like being in the zone and everybody has different things that bring them into the zone, but that's what, that's what feeds one's ability to be more embodied and confident in yourself. And, and I, so I think it's really important for we visionaries, we're the new myth makers and the visionaries but so many empaths and, and incredibly creative people that I know are shut down and really not able to be or willing to be seen in the world and share their gifts because of this confidence gap. And so, you know, it's, it's, my, it's my soapbox to try to figure out how to help us become more embodied and confident. Mm-hmm. So I love hearing your risk stuff. That was great. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that, I mean, that's certainly been a lot of my experience. You know, when I was younger, I was definitely shy and introverted and so on. And, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't even remember why it started, but at some point I decided that if I was afraid of something, I should do it. Yeah. And if I was really afraid of something, I should do it twice as fast, right? <laughs> and, and, and that led me to the place where I then decided I needed to back off from that too. But I think that, you know, sort of looking at that kind of, how do we step into our discomfort and, and work with that, right? How do we step into that and make magic in that space, right? Because, right. you know, it's one of the options that we can use to generate energy to convert and change it into something else, right? You know? That is beautifully, I, I'm a big, I'm a big note taker. I'm a scribe. And when, because uh-huh. ideas are elusive, this is one of the things I teach people in my courses is, you gotta write this stuff down because it floats yeah. through like the wind. Sure. So I love that idea about how do you create it's alchemy. I mean, it's really it's alchemy. This this when you step in, when you show up and you say, Okay, I'm gonna do something that's out of my comfort zone. And and you know, I believe we have this whole uh, corporation of guides and ancestors and spirits around us who are supporting us. I you mm-hmm. know, some people have the the higher self idea that it's all our higher self. And we are in this ascension process, I believe, in becoming God's incarnate. And I do believe that there are distinct beings that are helping to guide us. And so, and a, and a destiny and all of that. And so, at least what I've seen is, if you show up, if you make those leaps of faith, the universe will meet you. Now, maybe not in the time frame. That's another tricky thing is, is timing. But you this doesn't go unnoticed like you are building this this confidence bank account and Mm -hmm. so i you know i love that idea about the magic the alchemy of of showing up and then doors opening well it you know i mean for me one of the things that i've sort of i've talked about in a few places like in uh uh episode i did where i was the guest recently with fabake if people want to go back and look at it but Um, You know, I I was talking about uh, these portraits that I do, these magical portraits, you know, Mm -hmm. and how these magical portraits and working with portrait and image and, you know, uh, playing around with growing my Dali-esque mustache and all these things, they're all, um, they're all acts of magic, right? They're all acts of transformation. And they're all me turning this energy back towards myself and working on that in one way or another to, to liberate that. And, you know, you're a person who's done a lot of uh, portrait work and, and also, you know, other sorts of representative stuff with yourself. Um, you know, what, what are you doing with that these days? How is that, how is that in your orbits? Oh, that's such a yummy, 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 yummy question. Um, I like flipping paradigms. I think that that's the punk rocker in me. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I like this and, and the, you know, the, the, spiritual mystical teacher student in me i like this you know it's odin hanging upside down and yggdrasil and getting the runes you know and sacrificing things i like this idea of um of flipping things and finding the power in them and so something that my oracle deck the oracle of initiation 
that photography series, the painted body, they look if you haven't seen the Oracle of Initiation, the images look like petroglyphs coming alive off of a cave wall. They're these beings of light, particularly the graffiti tunnel ones. And there's no Photoshopping or editing to the images. And those were done between 2007 and 2008. And that was before the word selfie had come into the common lexicon. Yeah. And I... They're sacred selfies. There's somewhere between 40 and 50,000 images because it was a ritualistic ceremonial process. I, the camera became, I became one with it. It was held in my hand, but I was dancing between the worlds. They let me take pictures between the worlds. And so that whole process, that was the enormous game changer. And, and as I say, I, I like to try to figure out how to support other people's transformation. There's only a tiny percentage of people who want to go get nude and tribally painted in graffiti tunnels and on the land and do this. Now, the people who want it, want it. But there's this um, piece about becoming other through this witnessing process. And, and so now I'm doing, you know, uh, what is that, 12 years later? Am I doing the math right? Yeah, 12 years later, I, I've been, um, I have an online class called Sacred Selfies. Now, so selfies get this bad rap. It's like this, it's everything that's wrong with social media. It's these young people who are self-absorbed, aren't self-referenced, and are trying to get attention, and the duck lips and the tits. And it's, no, this is self-portraiture and witnessing of oneself is an ancient process. And it's a way of recognizing who you are, finding self-authority, self-agency, and it's Fun. Like everything that I want to do is fun on it may be intense, but it also needs to be fun. And so well, if you go self, to, a, to an art gallery that has like yeah. a big selection of work from the last couple hundred years, or last hundred years anyway, maybe even more, you're yeah. gonna see plenty of portraits of the artists doing portraits of themselves, right? This impulse to be seen and to understand how we are seen or how we present ourselves in the world is part of the classic human conundrum right like that's it's why essential. that's why we have an ascendant right in astrology like right. it is an element that is a part of our nature of the world right you know yes. and, I, and i'd be curious how does our ascendant influence our feeling about selfies now there's a wonderful inquiry to right. well, pass that, on to my astrological friends ask them well and that's and that's the sacred selfies piece and um carolyn mace the one of the teachers interesting spiritual teachers she said a really interesting thing some years ago that really struck me she said historically as spiritual beings and guides and teachers we've done this hollow bone thing we've done this thing where we want to get out of the way be an agent of spirit and just like the ego is gone like we just we just are this hollow bone you know it's classic you hear it she said particularly since the 80s We've been doing this interesting thing where we're weaving, we're merging our ego selves, like our earth plane selves, the, the integrated ego, because ego's not bad. E ego, if it's in a wounded state, it has its issues. But ego unto itself, you wouldn't get out of bed or be able to interface with people on the earth plane if we didn't have an ego. So she said what we're doing is we're integrating this, this hollow bone surrender sacrifice sort of a classic historic energy of the healers um, transformer and we're bringing our ego along with it we're bringing the personality in a really integrated beautiful um expansive way and i love that so to me sacred selfies that's that's what you're doing when you're playing with it with it in a really intentional way like that mm -hmm. well and i think that you know this relationship to the ego and the idea that, you know, I, I mean, for me, the ego needs to be, to borrow a phrase from like kind of ceremonial magic about this stuff, right? It needs to be redeemed, right? By the higher self, but it doesn't get to be abandoned, right? And just like, you know, like if we think that we're going to ditch our shadow self at some point, <laughs> free of that thing, right? right? But like there's this notion that we'll somehow be complete and free of, of all of these things. But like that's, you know, that's not what Jung meant by integration, right? Like that integration process is a process of having a living dynamic communication between all of those pieces that is balanced, 
monitored, adjusted as it needs to be, and and continuous, right? Like we, we don't reach the end of the work, right? You know, and I, I remember talking to my, you know, one of my Lakumi elders, and he's like, you know, one of the biggest mistakes people make is that they think that being a priest means that this person's going to be perfect, or being a priest makes you perfect. And it's like, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's just another layer of things. And all of your human foibles and all of your need to do your taxes and all these other things and all of your desire exists still and you got to roll with it and you got to balance it and you know work on it and keep it where it needs to be it's you know you don't get to take your hand off the steering wheel right right i love that i love how you how you said all of that that piece is that you uh living dynamic communication and and that's you know that's what you know clearly clearly culture as we've known it is melting down because it's it's needed to you know where nobody can nobody can miss that and i what you were talking about you know speaking to your elder about i call that this idea it's a very prevalent in our tribe of spiritual perfectionism and to me that's this idea that somehow i'm supposed to be relaxed and forgiving and let anybody do anything that's bullshit there is discernment with relationships with what is going on. And so I feel what we're seeing in the outer world and then working through in ourselves is these last vestiges of these inherited, I call them lineage codes, but inherited shadows, you know, the ugliness of the, the racism and the sexism and all these sorts of things. And that we, you know, there's, there's, uh, we've, we're throwing bombs into these things that if we pop the boil, it's all out there, you know, it's all been there. But now it's it's being seen in a way in certain communities and certain um, cultures. It's not hidden anymore. The shit that's going down, and so you you, along with the the bringing joy into the work that you do, there's also some points where you got to get real and figure out how to release and integrate some of this baggage, this you know, epic baggage that we've inherited of wounds. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we, we, all, we all come from cultures that have all sorts of unhealthy things in it. You know, I mean, there's no culture that I know of that I would say is free of it, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and as we become hopefully wiser, or maybe, maybe more literate about how bias and prejudice and, the, you know, all the effects of history and, and culture play out, you know, it becomes part of our work to cut that away and to free ourselves from that, you know, and well, that's not easy either, right? Back to the courage piece, you know, yes, it, takes, it takes courage to look at that and say, huh, I was being an asshole there. Huh, look at that. That's a really, you know, inappropriate notion that I inherited from here or from there or from I don't even know where, right? right. And, and to have the wherewithal to sort of uh, look at that and try and chip away at that. But in the same way as the the integration process, that's also a, an ongoing piece of work because, you know, we can only we can only understand as much as we understand, and we can only work from what we know. And yeah. as we, as individuals, and to some extent, you know, collectively as well, uh, have become clear and have better models and an understanding of these things, then then we have the space to to do more work and to become freer or better integrated. Still, you know. Yeah. Exactly. That, Andrew, that. <laughs> Just go and do that, everybody. Just go and do those things. <laughs> so one of the things I'm curious about uh, is I've been seeing a lot of, uh, in your work and in other places, a return of data and a return of sort of surrealism, you know, and yes. I've been bringing it back around in my uh, land of the sacred self oracle that I've been been doing and you've been doing it in in your cut-up work in other places why why do you think dada is is so important why is it coming back well that's that's a beautiful question i grew up in a family of professional artists and what i didn't realize when i was growing up that that was uncommon that everybody didn't get this and everybody uh -huh. and my family's amazing i mean my family is as amazing as they are wounded and my family is epically amazing and so mm -hmm. since I was a kid, there was this, what I found is that people who have embraced their curiosity, who have embraced their creativity, this doesn't always mean your job is going to be being an artist, but this is about being alive 
and curious and full of wonder. Well, this is a very childlike energy in a, in a wonderful way. And so I grew up with people who were always messing around and exploring and breaking outside of boxes and looking at things in different ways. So we would, one of the classic surrealist Dadaist games is exquisite, the exquisite corpse, which you can do with words and you can also, we would do it with drawings. And it's basically this process of taking a piece of paper, folding it into different sections and then deciding if you're going to do a, a human figure or just something that's random. And each section that is folded, a person in the group does some drawing and then continues the lines of that drawing down to the next folded section. Well, then they hide, they fold over their section so that the next person just sees these leader lines and they start their drawing or, you know, they were told they got the, you know, torso of the body. They do their torso of the body in their style with their vibe. And then you unfold it and you have this miraculous montage, this collage of everybody's goofy, strange, wonderful ideas of what this figure or um, open-ended thing was. And it's so delightful and so interesting and so strange. And I like, I love things that are odd and I've always loved things that are odd and odd connections. And so the Dadaists and the Surrealists who were a couple of movements, if you don't know, um, art, cultural movements in the early, um, early 20th century, early last century into the you know, probably 40s, 50s. And they were groups who were very connected to dreams, very connected to randomness. They, they wanted to, I call it getting, I'm going to swear. Is, is it totally bad if I swear here? You've already been swearing. Go ahead. Okay. Carry on. So get the fuck out of the way. Like that's one of my tenants because as I said earlier, my, my empath became very controlling and perfectionistic to try to manage how scary the world was when I was younger. So for me, all of my art is about getting out of getting the fuck out of the way. Yeah. And because I believe that there is this dialogue, this incredible, rich dialogue that the universe wants to play with us and co-create with us. And but you gotta get out of the way. And you yeah. gotta not be uptight and let randomness blow you away. And so to me, I think that part of and also historically, particularly the Dadaists, were during the First World War. So they were also reacting to this absolute horror that was happening in Europe, um, particularly across Europe, um, of all of the all of that of the war, and so they were trying to find a way to connect, to humanize, to not lose their humanity, and to try to bring some play and joy into a world that was horrific. And I feel like in some ways we're there again. In some ways, we're a lot more. Well, I don't know if we're more addicted but we're more distracted with the internet. You know, they didn't have the internet and things, um, you know, porn that you can access at any moment. And I'm not anti-feminist porn, so don't go, don't go there. But I'm just saying this is a distraction for people. Um, and so I think that we are looking, I think people are hardwired for magic, for ritual, for ceremony, for surrender. And I think most people have lost access to that. So to me, the surrealism and the Dada-ness and the things that I do where I, I, you make your own handmade cards and I call them funky fortunes, but I've also called them Dada divination, wild style divination, is that this is a way to get you out of the way and remind you that the world is enchanted, the world is magic, and there's actually clear directives and messages in that. So that, you know, like you, the dada would cut up, take a poem, cut it up into all of the different words, shake it up in a bag, pull the words out one by one and glue them back down onto a piece of paper to get this new, new thing. When you do that, really interesting, not random, not random things occur. And so to me, I, I've, I've done a bunch of videos on unorthodox oracles I like to mess around. I'm, I'm irreverent. That's the, that's the punk. That's the hip hop in me. So I think that we are trying to remember that the world is enchanted, trust that in ourselves. And we, we want that interface as a balm to the world blowing up. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I think, I definitely think that, um, well, I think that this, this notion of re-enchanting the world, right? That, 
that comes out. You know, I, I, I've heard a variety of people talking about it. Um, you know, I mean, I think that that's, um, that's an important thing, right? You know, when people, I, I, like, uh, I like a quote from Terrence McKenna, right? When, when you find yourself lost or when the world doesn't make sense or things, horrific things happen or so on, right? When we find ourselves in what feels like it might be a dead end, we start looking backwards for some some semblance of sanity somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And and I feel like in this sort of um, in in the modern era in which we live, you know, there's this weird mix of um, scientific materialism and fake news and actual war and genocides and horribleness and you know all of the the race and crimes against women and you know and all the things that are going on and as that stuff emerges uh it's part of that sort of deconstructing what's going on and seeing what's really happening there right mm -hmm. and not that it hasn't been there all the time but it's more visible than it ever has been for many people not for everybody because obviously sure. anybody who is the subject of those problems um and crimes is yeah. fully aware many communities have always been aware but um but like a lot of people start looking backwards for what makes sense. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and so there's a sort of return to more magical ways. A lot of people are looking to sort of get back to living magical lives and the saints are returning to people mm -hmm. in a common practice mm -hmm. and art is regaining its magic. You know, it's shedding some of this sort of legacy of postmodernism and all that kind of stuff that for me uh, didn't go anywhere, you know, <laughs> I mean, I went to art school and I was fully in all that stuff for a while, which is why I made no art when I left art school. I was like, this is all bullshit. I have no interest in this at all. And yeah. it's not that I don't see things in it that could be interesting, but I just, it wasn't me, right? And so finding, finding my way back to uh, surrealism and to the magic of those dream and trance states and, and all of those things, to me, that's where a lot of the power is. And that's where the power to change myself and others is, which is what I'm really interested in, you know? Yes. And so like when I was working on my, my Oracle deck, I would do these drawings and I would start just by making a shape, right? On the page, you know, or on the screen, cause I was drawing digitally. And then I'm like, all right, what's inside the shape. And then I would like turn it, like basically turn it inside out in my mind and go inside the shape and find out what was in there. I'm like, Oh, is there something outside the shape now? And it was this sort of, almost a uh, perpetual Escher like shifting between perspectives. Mm -hmm. And, and then at the end of this, I was like, Oh, and now the dream is finished revealing itself. All right. This one's done next. And that lack of trying to control it, mm -hmm. I think is so important, right? Kind of like your process with your Oracle of initiation. You know, you didn't sit down and think I'm going to control all these things. You went and did a thing. And in that process, that, that as you put it the between the worlds vision emerged right oh i just oh andrew i love so many things about what you said so you know part of what i feel really is a natural um ability with all humans is ability to be much more intuitive much more instinctive and once again you know this gets back to the addictions in some ways and the other people's voices that need to be clutter cleared I believe that we really all have this ability to be very tuned in, mm -hmm. but only a certain percentage of people have apprenticed to that skill. And you do need, to, I mean, some people come in with a certain, I came in obscenely psychic. I am super psychic and very, 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 very empathic for about 20 years. I had a hard time leaving the house. I, it was, that's, I, I was in the cave. I was in the, in the mystics cave for 20 years, but um, I do believe that we naturally really have, and that artists, that's part of what artists apprentice to is this, the muses, the getting the fuck out of the way, whatever you want to call it. And that you, what you're saying about you do, you do a, you do this circle and then you like merge into the circle. Like what's in the circle? Like the circle is this field, this entity, this, this creation field. And I believe that everybody actually has access to that. You know, there'll be different mediums that people will use and different ways that you use it. But that's so what I feel is really something that's lacking is that people's ability to access that because it's so nourishing on a core level back to this zone. You know, that's what I found when I made my Oracle deck 
was this, I, I went back to what I truly loved. I went back to what the core aspects of myself were. And as I say, this is why at 50, when in this culture for women, you're supposed to be freaked out because your value is going down. Because I still believe for women in this culture, the main uh, ticket that we have, the main value is attractiveness. And, and that's, that's a massive issue that, you know, we, we won't go into all of that. But um, I figured out how to tap into and source this massive curiosity and joy and creative passion obsession basically that I have and it feeds me like nothing else has ever fed me and so you know what you're talking about I feel like that's just really an enormous piece of everything that we're talking about about the integration and the finding our power and the living the lives that we want to lead is this um is access to this Mm -hmm. yeah well it's one of the things like you know, cause I, cause I have the store and stuff like that. People are often asking me like, well, how did you become successful? How did you make all this happen? Mm-hmm. And nobody really likes the answer because the answer <laughs> is mostly I made a lot of art and I kept showing up. <laughs> kind of the answer, right? Because for me being in that zone and being creative and making things, um, everything that I need to do to support that shows up when I commit to that process. Mm. Right. And when I don't commit to that process, then everything that I, everything that I, I do, it isn't always more labored, but it can definitely be way more labored. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I haven't made art in a couple of weeks. Shut up and go make some art, Andrew. And then, and then all of a sudden everything flows from there. Right. Well, in this, I think that this is some, you know, a piece, we could go back to that piece about courage, courage slash dedication is nobody else, you know, Elizabeth Gilbert's most recent book, um, Big Magic, I feel like it's the modern version of the artist's way, you know, it's the more, it's the next step in this. Um, And right now I'm actually listening to Quest Love from The Roots, his um, book on creativity that I'm really excited about. But um, part of what is is happening i think in the world is this this need to sanctify ourselves is you know it's what partly what elizabeth says in big magic she gives a lot of really actually very practical good information about actually owning yourself as a creative person and so you did that you said on some level there is I want to do this there's value for it i'm not going to let everybody else have ideas about why i shouldn't do this um, and I'm going to do it and I'm going to keep showing up. And that's a huge issue, I think, for um, a lot of people. And um, and I think women in the Western world have had, not that men don't have their struggles, and I don't want to totally do a, a, a gender separation thing, but mm-hmm. there are some messages that women have gotten about being very accommodating and taking care of everyone else. So what I found working with women and being having the people pleaser in myself is that there's this road to believing that your visions are are worth pursuing and then having the courage to keep showing up and showing up and showing up because it's a bit of magic and alchemy and then it's a bit of down and dirty doing it doing it doing it doing it and so that's what you did so that's that's so so beautiful and so essential so essential yeah well you know and as somebody who uh is raising two female identified Mm -hmm. kids, right? I I see a lot of these things. I'm always looking at what are the messages they're getting? What are they being told? What's being reinforced? Where can I give them a bit more punk rock to say, fuck that shit, you know? Because like- Go dad, go! You know, it's great. So, uh, you know, my my kids, um, we we give them more freedom than many people are comfortable with, right? In our neighborhood and stuff like that. And we let them go to the playground by themselves and so on. You know, and I, and I think that it's important, and I, I think that from my perspective and from a risk perspective, it's not it's not that dangerous. You know, it's not a it's not a problem. And I, but it freaks parents out, right? And it freaks mm-hmm. adults out a lot to see, you yeah. know, kids out by themselves anywhere. You yeah. know, if you're not like 15, they're like eyeballing you and being like, "Where's the parent?" Right? Yeah. And uh, so last summer, my my youngest was uh, 
was you know over over going to the playground with with their sister and uh and some adult was like are you by yourself where where are your parents and she gave the best answer which is that's none of your business i kept going and i was like yes exactly right because because we don't have to you know, we shouldn't capitulate you know i mean i might have been more you know graceful or polite or something about that but you know it's perfect and it's clear and it's a firm answer and you know people people want it both ways right they they want like don't talk to strangers because it's dangerous but let us intercede and you know treat us with respect and talk to us right it, it doesn't work that way you know and that's not that's not real right so you are yeah. raising riot girls and i love you i love you for that. <laughs> thank you thank you well and you know part of it also is i feel that with this because you know being 50 i was a kid in the 70s and there was depending on where you lived there was a lot more freedom in the 70s we didn't have media that was so sensationalized and every parent didn't think constantly my child is going to be abducted the amount of children that are abducted by strangers is like being hit by lightning um if children go somewhere it's usually a disgruntled parent or a family member or something and not that i'm saying that that's okay but but what in the 70s we messed around in the ravine in the gully that was down the way without adults around. You know, I studied early child education and I was a nanny for years. And so this we, is we to, I, I lived at the edge of town where, yeah. I, where I grew up and we would hike, I think it's five kilometers, five miles, yeah. something like that yeah. to the summer camp when it was closed, that was in the oh. woods. <gasps> we would hike there and play in their playground and climb on the buildings and whatever. When I was like in public school, you know, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10 years old, probably less, yeah. you know, and yes. like, nobody knew where we were. You no. know, we were so far in the woods, right? There's nobody around. There's nobody there, you know, and nothing ever happened, you know, I mean, again, not to say that stuff didn't happen elsewhere that I wasn't a part of, but like, yeah, you know. But you, you know, I mean, really, you know, generally the, the, like a kid will break their arm or something. I mean, it was like. But that's yeah. not, that's not, what I learned and, you know, studied in early child education is what I feel is we are, we are creating weak people. We are creating people who don't understand their instincts, who don't have stamina. And when you leave, children are not supposed to be with adults 24-7. Adults don't want to be with children 24-7. No disrespect True to children. Fact. <laughs> nobody, nobody, you know, that's, but so when kids are alone, there's a tremendous amount of social interaction and power and confidence and jockeying that they learn that when adults are hovering around, they don't have. And there's uh, things about their edges and their boundaries. It's one big long rite of passage that they need. And so I'm actually fairly concerned about what this means, that kids are sitting in front of a device, shut up in a house for their health, for their spiritual and energetic stamina. Um, and so, but I, what I love about your riot girls, your beautiful riot girls, is that they're, you're teaching them also to trust their instincts. We don't trust particularly girls to trust their instincts. And so going to the park alone, your girls are going to be alert. You know, your girls are not going to be la la la. They're going to understand that this is a privilege that they have, and they're going to learn and hone their stamina to read the vibes. And that's what you have to do in life. And if, if something doesn't feel right, well, you run home. Your girls would run home, right? Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Yeah, that's yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's interesting. I, I, I don't worry about the, the digital age and the, the impact of, mm -hmm. of tablets and things or whatever on people. I'm curious about what they're going to do with it. Because I think that sooner or later, right? Yeah. Um, all these impulses that you and I are talking about that we've explored and brought in, whatever, those right. are just human impulses. Right. Mm -hmm. And growing up in a more digital age or, you know, where, where stuff's happening in, in other ways, sooner or later that those impulses are going to gain enough momentum or have enough urgency that they're going to emerge from those people too. Right. And right. then they're going to show us something we've never seen before. Yes. So I'm, I'm very fascinated with that. I, I have this, this uh, oracle that I made for myself and a lot of it's just sort of little things that I feel like I need to be reminded of. And, uh, and one of the sayings on one of the cards is 
uh, the youth know the way. Oh. And I'm like, all right. You know, when it comes up, I was, it makes me think about well, what do they know, you know? And like, what, what are they, and not in a like old man shaking their fist, what do they know? Oh. Although I have my old man moments too, right? But like, <laughs> um, but like, what, what do they know? What are they doing? What's going on? Where, what is the meaning that they're perceiving in this? What is the value to them, right? And right. You know, it's, when we can run into those things with curiosity, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's fascinating. And for me, then I get to sort of, experience something new and i get to think about things in a different way and you know and to me that's wonderful it's not easy to always sustain that kind of uh approach and it's not always easy to um to access what's going on with those people because you know 16 year olds don't really want to talk to me necessarily you know <laughs> certainly not random ones on the street right um but i but i'm curious you know it's and it's one of the great things like i'm uh a scout leader for my kids' cub troop, right? And getting to spend time with with those youth and and you know they're uh, eight to eleven year olds, and then at, at bigger things, you know, there are teenagers of, and, and other ages there as well. For me, I get to see what they're about and what they're doing, and what they're interested in, and you know, when I'm at my best, I get to be like, wow, what are you getting from that? What's inspiring about that? You know, what is that? What what need is that fulfilling in you? And, how come, how come I don't understand it at all, you know? And, and it, it's really, it can be fascinating, so. Well, and I, I feel like with, the, with the, some of the younger people and some of the millennials that I've connected with, they came in with a different operating system than we did, that their, their whole structure of, of how they're wired is very different than what we got and what we inherited with the cultural expectations, the boxes, mm -hmm. the prejudices, um, that they, what I've seen, you know, they get, they get bashed for being self-absorbed and all of that. But what I've also seen is that they have these, this visionary, these visionary aspects to them that are epic, that are, that blow me away, that the, the visionary in me goes, wow, I'm a Model T car and you're a rocket ship. Like, and so I do, I wonder what they, like you say, I, I, I don't even know I feel like I came in to help anchor some of those folks and then the folks more of my age who are those in between who are pretty visionary, particularly for our time frame. but we got nothing on what those, those younger people have. And you're right. They're going to do things, make the science fiction moves that we've found of having a TV in our hands. They're going to make that look like that's kindergarten. And so yeah. I'm pretty thrilled about it too. Well, I think that that, that it's a great, uh, great mantra or you know something to to sort of both embody and keep the ego in check right i'm yeah. visionary for my generation I'm visionary yeah. for my time visionary for my brain you know because like we look back at you know especially because like i've read a lot of stuff by you know because i was in ceremonial magic and in that sort of crowley stream of stuff you know the guy was visionary for his time in certain ways in certain aspects yeah you know and he sure. was totally horrendous in many ways because of his time and because of his upbringing and because of his personality, you know, right. and, and, you know, you know, I, I hope that I, I never have as many downfalls as that dude had, but to think that we don't have them, right. It's, it's just folly, right. You know, it is folly. It's all folly. I mean, that, that, I mean, that, that's really, it is we as humans, I think we get all caught up and we get, Oh, we get in all these spins Reality is we're a bunch of goofballs. I mean, that's the reality of it. We're t stumbling around like toddlers, all of us. And anytime you think you really know, or you're totally sure, good luck with that. How's that working for you? I mean, you know, that's, you, you gotta, you know, that's the thing coming, uh, being a recovering perfectionist. I can laugh at myself now before I judged myself, judge myself terribly. Now I go, oh yeah, you're insecure there. Or, oh, you're, you know, being kind of neurotic or whatever it is. And then I'd like kind of laugh and pet myself like, oh baby, you're so clay footed. Isn't that fun? Uh -huh. and it's, it's a, it's a miracle. So I think that's what I would hope for all of my brethren listening to this. Can you come to this place where you love and accept yourself enough? You can laugh at yourself. Mm -hmm. So this kind of brings me to one of the one of the other things I wanted to chat about with you, though, right? It's been a real journey for you, mm. right? Like Ooh. you were saying, twelve years ago was when you made the Oracle of Initiation, right, yeah. or something like yeah. that. Yeah. 
and now here you are um, living that in an embodied way, much mm -hmm. more, you know, and, and with other people in a, in a much more embodied way, right? Yeah. How, how did that journey happen? How did that go for you? It's um, never in a million years could I have told you that I would have this life that I have now. And I think that's true for everybody. But yeah. I went down some really alternative paths. You know, I took some paths that were not taken, some serious right turn, left turns off of where I was coming from. And it helped me have the life that I always dreamed of that I didn't even realize was possible. Like I, to, to, to tell, I've gone from a model T car from a big wheels, you know, a big wheels um, toy to a rocket ship in, in the growth game that I've had. And part of it was not by choice. My own issues of safety and security and um, control. I, wouldn't have left the life that I had at that point in Seattle. I grew up in Seattle in a family of professional artists and was always very creative and independent in my own way. But I also really wanted kids. I wanted kids more than anything. I loved kids. And I actually still love kids. I just don't want to give them time, the time that they deserve. I, I have another dialogue that I want. My creativity is my dialogue. And so kids, kids are not going to get that dialogue from me. You know, other, other people, thank you, can take some for the team and raise the kids. Um, but my, you know, the journey of wanting, be, wanting to be married and have this Martha Stewart sort of a lifestyle. I, I come from a family of designers and architects and artists, and I love homemaking. I, I have a homemaker in me. I love food. I love beautiful design. But that I didn't realize how mystical I was. I didn't, I had forgotten. I had blocked a lot of it off of, of how intuitive I was, how psychic I was. And so the universe and myself conspired to send me in this totally different trajectory than where I had been. And um, my husband died of cancer when he was 37. I was 33 and he was wonderful. Um, and I'm not just putting him on pedestal because he's dead. Um, he was a gift from the angels. He was so much healthier than me. He was a very healthy, loving, integrated man. To be honest, I've only, I've met a small amount of, of men who have had the access to heart and love that he had. He was, he was extraordinary. Um, and he died and I didn't have kids. And I had some resources. I didn't have to go get a, a nine to five job. And I spent basically seven years on a quest to find, to revitalize who I was, to find who I was. And I always knew that, that art was central to who I was. Like I, I'm, I breathe, I, every cell in my body is art. I am living art. Adventure. I love exploring that. That's the happiest. I'm the happiest in my whole life when I'm exploring and then um, spirituality in the land. You know, there was my spirituality, my mystical spirituality was evolving. But so in that seven years on that quest, I did about, you know, 15 lifetimes worth of study and engagement and mm -hmm. incredible teachers and learning. And then I made the Oracle deck, you know, I made this deck there. So, you know, we're going to, after this, let's talk about the dreams about the last, the last in, in interview that you and I did. I had had some dreams about you and your Orisha deck. Yeah. But my Oracle deck um, predominantly came out of dreams. I was having dreams. Other people were having dreams, these amazing dreams of um, animals and human shape shifting of people getting up off of one divination card and moving to another, like being alive. Mm. And, um, and I, I followed the stepping stones. I followed the path. I courageously, and you know, here's another thing about courage and about following your path. I, I will bet you, I would bet you money. I would bet you something that if mm -hmm. you gave a, a survey of people enough money to live two years, three years, five years, and follow their passion and go for theirs, there would still only be a small percentage. There's something that you have to click in to go for it. And people, a lot of people say, well, it's the money and I have the mortgage and, and kids, kids do make a difference. I'm humbly, I don't have kids. So I'm humbly saying that you make 
different choices when you're responsible with children. I'm very humble about that. And still, you still can make other choices. And so I, something in me, had the ability to, to tap into this courage and this fierceness and this not knowing and follow these impulses. And that's how I ended up in New Mexico with the structure. It took me six years to do the deck. But the structure of the deck was all in place. But the artwork of these dreams of animals and human shape-shifting and light beings moving around, it wasn't happening in 2D, 2D art processes. I got a new camera. This is before my iPhone adventures. Now I'm obsessed with what iPhones can do. It's amazing. But, it's amazing. But I, um, I had this epiphany. My work comes through epiphanies. And I was driving along. And I had done this, I had been trained in this whole body of work called the Earth and Body series. They were sacred selfies. This was from 2005 to seven that I took around the world. And I learned how to get out of the way and be drawn to locations. I would disrobe so that I would be vulnerable and connected to the earth, like becoming primal back to the earth. I'd hold the camera in my hand, you know, I became an extension of my body. And I would take these mystical, spiritual opening between the veils pictures. And so when I got to New Mexico, found some new graffiti and tunnels that was vibrating in a different way. You know, like my mystical um, capacity had opened more. My channel was more, my conduit was more open. And then this epiphany came of taking those nude earth and body photos that there were, you know, 20 to 25,000 of those and taking it to the next level and tribally painting myself and adorning myself, which I've done. I've done sacred selfies since I was a kid with Polaroids, with photo booths. Um, it's just one of my jams. It's one of my things. And so I started doing in 2000, in June of 2006, I went down into this graffiti tunnel that I found, had gotten paint at the theater store, had all of these horns and scarves and amber necklaces and things. And I took these pictures with a new camera that you that would it was more sophisticated and you could get pictures in lower light as part of how my images happened is about iso and about sparkly things and some ambient light and tunnels and the graffiti and i took these photos and they blew me away and so this was this whole journey this whole trust walk and when i started it i didn't know i could do such an epic project and you know I think it's such an important thing to note too right yeah like, i think that if people knew what it would be at the end, mm -hmm. they would probably never start, right? But they wouldn't because it's too hard. It's too hard. It's too far from where they are. The innovations and inspiration that the journey or the road provides aren't there in the beginning. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, so it's one of those things, right? Starting the process and, and allowing and trusting that the process will come forward to something is, the big, is one of the biggest things, right? You know? and. Right. And it's tough when you, when you don't have history with it to trust it, right? It gets easier with time, but yeah. Totally true. And that's, um, that's it. I mean, it's, it's tough to trust it when you, I'm writing this down, um, when you don't have history. And that was the thing that gave me history. That was the thing that has changed my life where I, I saw, because I'm, as I say, I was very insecure for many years. And I, I am a good synthesizer. I, I have a brain. I, I have a brain that is able to synthesize things well. I, I'm, 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 you know, we also have this, this uh, culture where people are not supposed to be proud of what they have, particularly women. Like you're supposed to be humble. People think you're arrogant. No, fucking own what you're good at. So I'm smart. I, I can synthesize and make connections. You know, that's the visionary plus the structure person. And I didn't realize how skilled I was at that because I was insecure. So in, you know, my Oracle book is 400 pages. I'm so proud of it. It's my woo woo PhD. Like I got my PhD, you know, we don't get, I should have a PhD in the woo world behind my name from that deck. I, I felt I, the same way when I, I made a, I did this 10, 10 week, two and a half hour class course on the Toth Tarot, right? Oh, and I was like, when I finished that, I was like, that's my PhD. That's it right, right. there. You there know. it is. Right. Yeah. The, the, decades and decades that we've been studying with this. And so that doing that project, and as I say, it took me six years to physically make it and then publish the book. And then we're 12 years in now, and there's always a learning curve with print on demand and self-publishing and all of that. Um, 
but it um, it was a game it was the game changer and as I say not everybody's gonna do that but you got to find something that is like that that is your game changer if you really want to anchor in your visionary self you're gonna have to over and over again show up and do do things that are out of your comfort zone and and you're gonna need to love it on some level or you won't keep doing it and yeah. so now I'm at this point finally I'd say probably 20 25 years worth of what I've visioned, what I've prayed for, you know, it's a combination of working for it. And then there's some grace, like you don't earn it. Like somehow it just anchors in it's both. And, and it's anchored in. And now I finally, like I'm, sh I feel myself in my body because empaths also have a hard time being in their body because this world is really loud. Um, but I'm finally in my body in a way and I'm, I'm come out of the cave. You know, I'm not in the mystics cave anymore. I'm that, that 20 years is over. And when I show up and teach at uh, conferences and workshops and public speak, I kind of stand there in myself and go, wow, this is so cool. Like I'm in my skin. I'm happy with myself. And if I, you know, make a mistake or I do something or I say something, you know, I'll stick my foot in my mouth sometimes. I don't shame myself for months anymore. I'm like, oh, that was kind of awkward. And we move on. And so, yeah. there's, so we, literally, I got the keys to the kingdom through following this path. And now also, I'm starting, I didn't make a lot of money for a long time. You know, I had other money that I was living on. You know, this is also something that people don't talk about. If you don't have the confidence to feel that you're going to be able to magnetize other people, don't quit your day job. You will not have a thriving career as a woo-woo person if you haven't sanctified yourself and i work with people and, around this and it is it is not easy it right? is not like, fucking when, easy when i started uh because you know, for a long time i wasn't i wasn't in the bigger tarot community or in the bigger spiritual community i was just you know working at a shop in toronto and and just doing my thing and when i when i started going around and meeting people I was amazed at how few people were making their living yes. doing stuff. And I was making my yes. living doing it. And how many people were being supported by their partner, yep. had a day job or all these things. Yes. And no shame on that. That's yeah. you do no. what you got to do. Exactly. But the perspective that I had seen and that many people kind of cultivated was that they were, that they were making it, but they weren't making a living they were, they were, you know, they weren't making enough money to support themselves. Solely on that work. Solely on that work. And I think that that is a thing that very few people talk about. And a very lot of people true. sell the dream. A lot of like woo woo, blah, blah, you know, marketing types and, and coaches and whatever sell people right. on that. And it's not that it's not possible, but it is not easy. And no. it's not as straightforward and probably not as fast as most people would talk about it happening. Oh, so. If you're going to jump into doing this kind of stuff full time, do it. It's amazing. And it's going to, it might take a while. And if anybody tells you that they've got some clear cut system where you're going to get there, don't believe them because uh, I've never seen it. So. No. And that's, you know, that's part of that's the confidence gap too, that I talked about is I think that with people who are really intuitive and visionary, because we usually do have, such an, uh, sensitivities that is, is a, it's our greatest gift, but there's also a way of embodying the ability to navigate the earth plane. And it's like the, it's like the yin and the yang. It's like the, the, the receptive intuitive part is very, very skilled, very, uh, and that was true for me for years. I'm bringing in now more of that, put it out into the world energy that was not as accessible to me. And so I, I get really irritated by those, by those people who are offering that I'm a coach and I'm, you know, working four hours a week from a beach in Bali and I'm, you know, making six, seven figures. Um, there are such a tiny percentage of people who do that, that it's, it's insane. And I think it sets up this unrealistic expectation. As I say, I, I probably, I made, when I had other money coming in for probably the last seven years or something, you know, but from, from a, I'm making more now and I'm self-supporting, but there, when there was other money coming in, I probably made about 
on average about a thousand dollars a month was what I made. Well, most people in the Western world, unless you live in like Mexico or something, you don't, you can't live enough on a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. Um, and, and I, you know, I've been building my brand pretty strongly for at least a decade, you know, and that's part of it. It doesn't, it doesn't totally happen overnight, but there is this piece about confidence and sanctifying yourself. And as I say, I, I work individually. I coach people on this because I have now anchored that in and I'm, and I'm making the resources but I did it for many years and, and it's very, it's complicated and you don't just say, bam, and I'm going to start, you know, coaching clients and make a thousand dollars per month, you know, on one client or whatever that doesn't happen overnight. And so there's this, there's this process. For sure. Yeah. Big deal. And I, and I, and I, you know, like I say, I agree. I don't appreciate this sham that's going in the spiritual world where people are pretending that they're, you know, making it. And, and if you do have a day job or a partner is supporting you, that's, that's beautiful. You're being taken care of. But this idea that you're just going to like print a business card and make a website and somehow clients are going to flock to you. That is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So the last thing before we wrap up, cause we're already yes. running a bit long here. Uh, it's just such a lovely conversation. I don't want it to end. Me too. So um, you had a dream before the last time we recorded. Yes. Right? And yeah. the thing that was fascinating about this dream is that I had told almost nobody that I was considering making an Arisha Tarot deck. Yeah. And you came on and you're like, oh, I had this dream, right? And I don't know if you remember any of it. Um, but it was something like I was showing you these cards that I was making and explaining them to you. And they were like floating in the air or something and revealing themselves, and, you yeah. know, and it, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's been, it's fascinating because here we are, however many years later and uh, this September, uh, my Arisha Tarot deck will be coming out through Llewellyn and will be available everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's been such a long journey because, um, because I took it so seriously because for me, I wanted to make sure that I was uh, respecting my tradition, you know, because this is my, my religious practice of the last almost, you know, 18, 19 years, um, you know, and I've been a priest for the last nine and a half years now. And I wanted to respect the culture that it comes from. And I wanted to, you know, I, I had so many things that I wanted to accomplish with making this process that I, that even though I kept feeling like, oh, I should just, just get it done. Like I should just finish it. It took such a long time to get completed really, you know, and it, and it was like, it was sort of percolating and growing and changing me along the way and allowing me to be, to become who I needed to be in order to give birth to it. You know, all of that, all of that. It's, you know, it's so interesting, um, the, the mechanics of visions. I find the mechanics of being, of being a conduit, being a translator, so fascinating, these pieces, and how we support each other, how we're part of this web that helps bring things through. And, um, you know, this idea that I, that other people got dreams for me, for my deck, that I got this dream for you when you weren't even speaking it. You know, I, I got on the psychic um phone line, the psychic ley lines, and uh, I got the phone call, I picked up the phone call, and then I told you I got the call, I gave you the message. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's fascinating to me when we open these channels, and we tend to these things, what comes through. And I also, I really want to give you some love and respect for all of the work that you do around inclusion, and diversity, and respect, and honoring um, in a lot of different communities because um, I'm putting in a plug for something. I feel like part of our, part of our job as creators and visionaries and new myth makers is social media was created to help market and make each other successful. So you, I feel it is your responsibility as a leader, my responsibility as a leader to share the products and things that we really respect, share the people like you're in Carrie's um, things that you're doing um, mm -hmm. together. Those things are amazing. I always share those. But Courtney Alexander, you know, you, you interviewed Courtney Alexander and the dust, the onyx. I, that is one of the 10 most excellent decks I have 
ever experienced. And I teach people how to make your own decks and Courtney yeah. blows me away. And yeah. so, and part of my soapbox is, and it has been for my whole life, it's a whole longer story, but this merging of different cultures and spirits from different cultures and um, social justice. And so one of my soapboxes is the divination world is very Northern European. It's very white. It's most of the decks that have been created are from a Northern European perspective. And those are fine if we have more diversity. We need more authentic diversity. And whatever it is about access to resources, um, whatever that is, there's a lot of issues around that. But so Courtney is, she calls herself a black queer woman. Um, and she's bringing information from her ancestors and the, the African lineage. And the deck is excellent. And so she's almost up to her $50,000 to print her next round. So you all need to go find Dust to Onyx. But for you, um, Andrew, I'm so thrilled that you're bringing through um, a deck from these um, diverse traditions and you are a person who has apprenticed to it, who has, you know, put in the time. It's of your heart. It's of your soul because we, we so much print on demand is such a miracle and it's a miracle that we can, I mean, you're working with Llewellyn, which is a bigger publisher, which is a, which is a very prestigious thing. I mean, that's, that's awesome. And you, we can print our own decks now. And so I just, I thank you so much for showing up and bringing through this, this is, you know, the, we're going to uh, flip the dominant paradigm partially by getting paid. And that's why also Courtney, let's pay Courtney. Let's have, let yeah. Courtney set up her publishing house for marginalized groups. Let's see more decks from people of different cultures, um, non-binary gender ones. I, I want to see decks from 16 year olds. We need more diverse voices. So I just, I really honor you and all the work that you do. And I cannot wait to see what you bring through about your well, I'm going to be very curious if it feels familiar to you. You know? Yes, from you, the dream. Oh, Because of the dream God. I asked you and you were like, no, nah, I couldn't, I can't, I can't remember seeing any of them. I just knew what it was. So I'll be curious when it arrives, if it like oh unlocks God. something that you perceived. So I'm going to wrap up by saying, uh, so speaking of youth and making stuff, yeah. it's just at Reader Studio in New York. Yeah. And uh, ooh, ooh. my kids made an Oracle deck to sell. I the, love those! And uh, this was the second iteration of it. And uh, they, they, my youngest had made one to raise money for uh, a charity called Rainbow Railroad, which people should go check out. Um, and uh, and what they what they they did was they made these cards and they were selling them individually and then somebody bought a set of them and whatever. Um, but by the time this goes live at the end of May, uh, my kids will be making more and selling them through the Hermit Slap website. So <gasps> go check it out. You can see oh. young young visionaries of of finding and embodying divination are are up to and, our little uh, sassy riot girls riot exactly. girl. Deck. And yeah, if you're if you're uh, other people out there who have stuff that that needs support or whatever, like bring it up. Send me an email. Send, let me know what's going on because uh, yeah, we all gotta we all gotta help everything move in the right direction. Me too. Me too. I, I like I say, I feel like that's part of our responsibility is to share on social media and expand each other each other's tribes so we get paid, getting paid so that we can. Um, take care of ourselves. You know, there's so much issues about money, but so take care of each other, us. right? Take care of each other. I love it. All right. Where do people find you, Lucia? Oh, well, you can. Um, I have the Oracle of Initiation website. So that's Oracle of Initiation, all shoved together.com. Um, I have a Melissa Lucia website that shows all of my, some of my bodies of work. I'm very happy on Instagram. You can find everything happening on Instagram under it's Melissa. The pinnacle, it's the pinnacle of social media. It's the best. I love, I love it. And, Facebook doesn't ruin it. <laughs> and I'm on, and I'm on Facebook um, also. And then my events, my online classes, my experimental photography classes, um, one, it's once a year now that I teach the how to bring the vision of your deck through to production in, starts in January, that class, which is, it's epic. That's another PhD of mine. Um, and I'm going to be teaching a lot of different places and public speaking um, more. And then 
for um, women and non-binary gender ones, I do this amazing four month process in the New Mexico desert where I created my deck where George O'Keefe lived, where we have a week immersion in New Mexico. And it's a very small group, intimate, um, basically, you know, priestess intuitive empowerment embodiment training called Temples Illuminated. And so that happens once a year from October, September till January. And that you have to, um, it's, that's not marketed anywhere publicly. That's really, you have to interview with me because that's pretty, um, it's pretty deep and powerful, but delicious work. So, and then I do intensive week long things in New Mexico at this point too, which I'm starting one with a woman today. We're going to go up to George O'Keefe land and do art and mystical stuff. Woo, woo. Love it. Thanks for being on. Thanks, it's honey. great to catch Wonderful. up with you. Again. Always to catch up. Always good. Thank you, as always, for listening. So if you enjoyed this podcast with Lucia, uh, we recorded a Patreon bonus for uh, the supporters at the $5 and level up over there. And it is all about finding and building your courage to make your art, to live your life, to walk a spiritual path and all that goodness. So head on over to patreon.com slash the hermit's lamp or follow the link in the show notes to uh, go and support the podcast and get in on this awesome goodness.